Hey there, I'm Lee Ullman here with some big news from the National Young Farmers Coalition. We're partnering with Heritage Radio Network on a special season of The Farm Report. It's all about what's happening with the Farm Bill and how it impacts farmers and eaters. I am growing diversified vegetables on land that's been in our family for 150 years. And so with the pandemic, gentrification, property values going up, we had to sell the land and we lost it. Join us as we uncover the untold stories behind this massive piece of legislation that shapes how we grow our food, what we eat, and so much more. The problems we have had, those are things that come from earlier Farm Bill and USDA policy, right? Like Earl Butts, get big or get out. You know, it's my responsibility to know not only what I'm eating, but then like how, how that all came to be and realize like, wow, like this piece of legislation, all this money, like it's technically something that I support as a taxpayer. While Congress debates the next Farm Bill, this is not just an invitation to listen. It's a call to action. Be part of the conversation. Subscribe to the Farm Report on Heritage Radio Network wherever you listen to podcasts. This episode is brought to you by HH Bespoke Spirits, featuring HH Bespoke Gin, Rum, and Vodka. Learn more at hhbespokespirits.com. This week on Meet and 3, it's the final episode of our series on global trade. We're thinking futuristically, from China's ambitious plans for a new Silk Road to the future of borders and automation. If you're a banana, you know, it's easy to cross the border. But if you're a person who's trying to follow the jobs, uh, it's a lot more difficult, if not impossible, to do so in an authorized and safe fashion. They love food trucks and they love growing your own food because these things are not dependent on essentially government systems. So there's a whole politics to pretzels on the dark web. Tune in to Meet and 3, HRN's weekly food news roundup, wherever you get your podcasts. Hey, everyone. Welcome to Snacky Tunes. I am one of your hosts, Darren Bresnitz. Would like to dedicate this week's episode to Ryan Diddy, who we lost this week. He was a good friend, great colleague, diehard Penguins fan and uh, he will be deeply missed so a lot of love a lot of support to his family and friends we will miss you we have a great la episode this week two great guys one making delicious food the other making incredible music first up justin picharunksi who runs anna jack tie at a sherman oaks with his parents which will be celebrating its 40th anniversary this summer he talks about joining the multi-generational business, what it means to work alongside your parents, offering up tips for people who want to do the same, and how his Thai Taco Tuesdays are the talk of the town. Then we hang out with Henry Hall, who plays us some live tracks off his full-length debut, Nito. We talk about his creative process during the quarantine, his fans, aka the Hall Monitors, and we learn a little bit about what it means to move a track out of your back pocket and onto a full length. It's a really fun interview and some really great tunes. So please sit back, relax, and enjoy Snacky Tunes here on HRN. We talk about food. We talk about music with musical dudes. Finger on the pulse, Snacky Tunes. Oh, 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 
Justin, thank you so much for taking the time to chat with us. We really appreciate you taking the time out of your busy schedule. And welcome to Snacky Tunes. Thanks. Awesome. It's great to be here. Um, so, you know, I, we've long felt at the show that to be a really successful restaurant, one that has longevity, you really need to become a neighborhood spot. And with Anna Jack Thai serving food for over four decades, you really ingratiated yourself into the neighborhood of the community. But can you talk a little bit about the importance of the customers and that community to your success and existence? Yeah, sure. Yeah. It's just about four decades. It'll just be four about. Decades. Yeah. In July, it'll be 40 years, which will yeah. be uh, a real party. I uh, don't know how we're going to celebrate it, but um, it's true. Like, I think the neighborhood spot uh, in many ways has kept us going for this long. It has definitely contributed to the success um, for the last, you know, especially for the last year, just to keep us afloat. Like if we didn't have all of those great people um, who have been coming every week and, and many people, they come like every two weeks, like every two weeks or twice yeah. a week or three, some, some people like three times a week. And, and just to see their faces. I mean, I feel like beyond just like tickets or whatever you want to call it, um, sales you know or customers or whatever it's like no like everyone here it's they're part of a team like everyone at anajak is part of the team the guests are part of the team as well like you wouldn't know how heartwarming it is for me to receive these like little things that um our our guests bring us like we needed lights for our alley and our Mm. guests brought us hung it and they're electricians in Hollywood, so it was really easy for them to do. Um, we needed uh, like a little projector set up for this one thing. And um, these one guests that are like close friends of ours now, like they brought that. And, and I realized, you know, the team is not just the team inside the four walls of your place. It's it's everyone else that's participating in, in the story um, as well. And everyone wants to like be a part of it around it and 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 part of like the feeling of it right and and even though there isn't four walls quote unquote anymore that you can kind of be in it's just the idea that like you know the family is a lot larger than anything so i mean i think just from an emotional standpoint it just really warms me to see when stuff like that happens and and i think it is because it's neighborhood and it's not yeah. like a destination spot you know yeah, no, I mean, I, I absolutely love that. And, you know, your father started the restaurant. Um, Thai food did not have maybe the same recognition that it does now in L.A. I, I would say that that cuisine is what, probably what people from outside the city associate um, with L.A. at large. But also, you know, when your father started the restaurant, your parents did, being a restaurant owner didn't have the same cachet it did. So what was it like as a kid with your parents running a Thai restaurant? And what do you remember fondly of being in that environment growing up? It's, um, it's interesting. Like a lot of people ask how, um, how it was like growing up as, um, you know, the kid of an immigrant, right? The kid of immigrant stories like seems to be something that a lot of people are very curious about, but did you experience, you know, um, a lot of, I would say, like, tension from uh, the community that you guys are, like, not, you know, you guys are Thai. It's like, is that Chinese? Like, what is Thai food? Like, or, or like, were you teased because of your food that you'd bring at school, right? Like, I remember hearing Dave Chang mm. like how you're like, oh, man, like, Dave's place smells like ass or, you know, like it's, you know, it's like all that kimchi. But for me, my personal experience is that my friends were stoked to, to come to the restaurant, come eat the food. They wanted to have my lunch, you know, when I was in middle school, like, yeah. like oh, you want to trade? And I'm like, I'll totally take that Lunchables for a chicken satay. <laughs> right. So I think that I'm, I'm very fortunate. I think my sister too, like we're very fortunate that like we grew up in this environment that people have 
an infatuation with it in this kind of way that's like, oh no, it's it's really cool. Um, I don't think it, there, yeah, no, there was no like celebrity status for restaurant owners. Mm-hmm. My dad kind of looks like a movie star in a way. He's just got this really nice, like handsome look. And when he was younger, I mean, he really had that look. Um, but everyone loved him. So I, I, I feel like that, that, that party has always been on since I was a kid. And dad had been the host for so long. And I had been like a party goer mm. in that space since a child um, until I had to throw the parties myself. <laughs> you know, it's interesting because um, that hosting trait or service industry trait wow. is sometimes just innate because of your environment, right? Like you grow up thinking that it's normal to be uh, you know, your parents to be known by everyone in the neighborhood because they're serving up great food and great drinks. And then you move into that and then you start looking around as you become a restaurant owner or in the service industry and you go, oh, maybe maybe not everyone opens up their doors to 100 or 150 people every night. Maybe that isn't normal. Oh, like dad, you know, when dad would go out and eat here in the Valley, like we'd always see like one of our guests like dining in the place that we were also dining. And then we have a conversation and we'd meet their family and we'd have the same exact conversation that we'd have in the restaurant. We'd have at someone else's restaurant with our guests. And it's the same, like, you know, like when we go out on the town, when we used to do that, like Royce and I would, like we would just go out and like, you'd see a billion people that you knew. Um, so yeah, dad totally did that way before I did. And now that I think about it, now that you mentioned it, it's like, oh, I don't know if it's nature or nurture. It seems more like nurture to me now. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, but that you touch on that um, a little bit and you've talked about it, but not everyone is lucky enough to go into the restaurant industry with having someone who has coming up on four decades of experience. So mm-hmm. what have you been able to take from your parents insights, things like that, um, that are unique to people who are working in multi-generational restaurants? Mm. You know, um, it's funny that you say, you know, the question is in some way slightly leading, like how, like not, not <laughs> as lucky as you to grow up in a multi gen or in a in a business that's had forty years. Sure, you understand that, like, it's like it is lucky. Like, I do have to say, I am blessed. You know, when I was really contemplating how I was going to make the full shift here, my friend said to me, he said, like, John, he said, uh, no, like, no one else gets this opportunity, like. Other people are just doing their jobs, but you get the chance to like work with their parents, like in their prime. And um, and my parents are not as much in their prime now, but like I'm glad that I got to do that, and that I get to have those memories to do that. Um, but my team knows, and it's not the first time I said it that like sometimes I just want to drop a nuke on it because there's so much baggage that comes with it. There's so much of my father's ways that have are still being done that i can't stand you know but like i have to contend with that um that kind of that kind of tension between the history of it and my need for a place that has four white walls and one burner you know like (laughs) so i feel lucky i also feel that it's it's uh you have to, I think as a, as a, as an owner, if you're, if you're in a multi-generational business, like you have to weigh how much of the history do you want to respect, how much of the tradition you want to respect versus how much of the innovation you know will overwrite some of that history. Yeah. Uh, you know, um, you haven't been shy either about when you decided to join the business um, that you made some changes to the menu and you did make some adjustments, which, you know, to a business that at that point had been 30 years mm-hmm. old with customers who definitely expect a certain type of 
uh, dish or maybe their favorite dish and you came in and you said, I'm so sorry, but we might not be offering that dish anymore. What was that pressure like? And how did you work with the loyal customer base in the community to both make the changes that you knew you needed to, right, for the success of the business, but also not alienate your loyal customers? It's uh, it's challenging, and my parents remind me about that all the time. <laughs> <laughs> the fact that you say they would love you because they they haven't met you, but they would love you because like they're like, see, other people understand it, <laughs> Justin. Like, why? <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, but that that your parents did write me and say we do have a question for, that we want to ask, Justin. <laughs> oh my goodness, I love that. Yeah, I I think. I think that it's been a struggle because I've seen some customers walk out because they're like, wait, you don't do the barbecue chicken anymore. And I'm like, I'm sorry, I, I, I can't do it. It's just like, I'm mad, you know, just us. And they're like, yeah, but your dad would do it. And I'm like, yeah, but like, look where dad's at now. Like dad broke his back. Like dad bent over, you know, backwards in order to make stuff happen for customers. And I think that, You know, the original generation of these types of businesses would be very, like, easy to please. Like, my father was easy to, he wanted to please people that came in, so he would do whatever needed to be done in order to maintain the business. That's just survival. But you move on to the next generation, more privileged, more self-centered in some way, and more of an artist, and I feel like, oh, what can I do that's within my abilities that isn't a compromise to who I am uh, and isn't a compromise to the food and to the cuisine. Um, And I I do think that the tension between the tradition and the innovation is what creates what I would say the identity of Anjak would be because it's not a takeout place only. You know, it's not like a Thai Thai restaurant and it's not like a fancy Thai restaurant. And it's not, and it's not even a taco stand, but it is kind of a taco stand. <laughs> so, yeah, um, I think it's that like all this Venn diagram, like, right in the middle of it. Um, you know, old customers being on one side and new customers being on the other side. Oh man. <laughs> oh man. Well, look, we're gonna we're, we're gonna take a quick break, and we're gonna talk about some of those changes, uh, especially you having one of the best wine lists of any restaurant in LA, not just a Thai restaurant and how you've adapted uh, in the last few months due to COVID and uh, I don't know, Thai taco Tuesdays, one of the best and most delicious alliterations in the game right now. Wow. But we have, we have a song from the archives and then we'll be back with Justin here on snacky tunes on HRN. Oh uh-huh. 
Hello and welcome back to Stacky Tunes. We are here with Justin from Anna Jack's High. Now, um, you know, we were talking a little bit about some of the changes that you made to the menu uh, back when you joined. Um, but beyond the menu, you've also really added an incredible wine program, which I feel like I didn't see until I got to LA um, of you know, wine being such a big part of Thai restaurants. And I was wondering if you could share a little insight on what made you want to add such a wine program and maybe a larger context of the importance with wine and Thai restaurants in LA. It's interesting. Like when I, I look at the old menus, my dad had like Kendall Jackson, Mm. AJ. He had like stuff that honestly, like, you just can't drink anymore. <laughs> <laughs> and I said to dad years ago, I'm like, I, I saved up like a couple hundred bucks. Like I'm just going to buy a couple cases of wine and then let's yeah. see where this goes. Like I fell in love with wine in Europe. Um, you know, went to Tuscany, went to Bordeaux, went to Santa Like, and that's definitely not the styles of wine that we serve now, but I, there is something about an agricultural product that makes me really excited. When I eventually, you know, I walk in, into the doors at Everson Royce uh, in Pasadena, like the week mm-hmm. opened, and I became friends with these guys, and I, we started drinking, and we start, and they started studying for their certified, and they started studying for this and this and that, and I was like, it, this is a really fun way to see the world. This is a really fun way to like study. This is a really fun way to you know, be, I, I, I just think like it adds so much to the meal when your beverage is so vibrant and tells as much of a story as the food. And I know I'm not the first Thai restaurant to do it. I mean, like Chris has done it for, you know, some, yeah. quite some time before. Um, and the natural wine, you know, our list is very natural slanting. Uh, yep. I totally understand that and it's 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 very interesting to see how uh, that's been changing because i want to have more styles you know i want to i want to contribute to other people's palates too not just my own like yeah i drink these types of wines because i think they go well with the food, but some people come in with like a paso robles zin and it's an assault to the palate and they want to eat it with thai food and they want to eat that with fish and i'm like well all right <laughs> but okay i just think it's a fun it's honestly the simplest part of the restaurant because you get to have a good time you get to taste you get to learn about the producers you get to share the stories you open the bottles and then done you know and there's and you really don't need more than one person to do that actually so, no there's something so satisfying from a restaurant operator perspective about that too yeah, and it's just nice. I think that people, um, you know, wine has just exploded and it's just such a great, you know, realization that it pairs with not just classic Italian, French, you know, American food is that it goes with a lot of different flavor profiles and, you know, there are different, as you speak to, wine flavor profiles that go really well with Thai food. Oh, and, yeah. just, and just to learn about that balance and to be like, oh, I never considered pairing these wines or even knew about this wine because when I only go to these types of restaurants, I'm only served these types of wines. It just expands your knowledge and appreciation of the dining experience as a whole. A lot of those wines, too, they're like multi they're multi generational as well, or they're like second career winemakers or they're like multi career winemakers. Right? Yeah. Jeff Fisher from Habit is also a voice on American Dad. Dan Petrovsky hmm. from Massigan was an uh, executive at, um, uh, he was a creative director, I believe, at Sports Illustrated. Um, the guys that make, the family that makes the Pinot and Bouvre, they're, they're, they've been making that, that wine since like the 1700s. 
and like their son converted the vineyards to organic and then that son's son did this and that and that this and like it's like wow that's such a crazy story like that that's what i'm doing you know that's how i was, I was gonna say do, do the uh generations the matching generations ever get together to both celebrate and commiserate their huh. their parallel struggles um of uh of both evolving and keeping the tradition alive yeah that's a good idea you know on um uh i i've been connecting with uh vanda from ayara thai mm. from Otis thai and all these other thai restaurants around uh romit um in in hollywood and the one that really struck me was when i when i met with vanda and vanda you know she took over her parents restaurant about yep. 10 years ago and um her food is delicious they're on the big four mond and her parents were making food like out of their house to like flight attendants in thailand uh or, or for thai airways international and they eventually opened up a restaurant and i'm like she asked me she was like do you feel alone in this journey justin do you mm-hmm. feel lonely doing this like because like you're trying to change something that is so deep inside your family that yeah you, know, you want to turn it into this one thing and i know how alone that journey can be so you know, I feel like the commiseration, it, it actually helped, you know, because I yeah. was like, oh, man, I, you're right. I'm not alone. You know, like other people have done this and Brenda's done this. And I can always reach out to her and be like, hey, I'm really struggling with this one thing. Like, what do you do? Like, I mean, it's just, it's just really good to have people who understand that push and pull. Now, one of the new offerings you've been giving up uh, and is Thai Taco Tuesday, um, which, you know, again, I feel like being in L.A., there has been, you know, a couple of well-known fusions between a tortilla um, that is widely accepted because it is just seen as a service mechanism in many ways, right, to put delicious flavor in. But how did your um, take on tacos get started? And what has the response been? Because I feel that um it's just been growing like wildfire ever since you launched you know when you cook like pad thai every day and you do like pad use every day like you you know and i i cook with a bunch of Oaxacan, so like you know you wonder what else do i want to cook today like how am i gonna impress these guys these guys see and taste this food all the time and like they're probably nostalgic about the kind of foods that they want to eat too and like, it's funny, like, dad used to do his family meal when he was a sushi chef. His family meals when he was a sushi chef were Thai food. And that eventually turned into him opening a Thai restaurant. Um, mm. Yeah, which is just insane. So I I was, I was, realized I'm, I'm doing the same thing that dad did, you know? Like, I was trying to press these pork, and I, I got these tortillas from Pr- Princesita. I got this really bomb pork from... Pete and Barnett, I'm like, I'm going to make the most badass carnitas that could be made because, and I just, I don't even want to throw a twist on it. I just want to do carnitas, carnitas. I did it. I'm like, this is actually pretty good, you know? I mean, I think this is pretty good. My, our guests, Bettina and John, they stopped by. This was mid pandemic. They're like, hey, can we just sit in the back and drink a beer? And I'm like, yeah, sure. 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 Eating a meal, drinking a beer. And, I said, you know what? Like, we're doing these tacos for family meal. You guys want to try some? And Bettina's from Mexico. She's like, this is honestly one of the best carnitas I've had in a long time. Mm. I was like, oh, whatever, get over it. And she's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Thai Taco Tuesday. And I'm like, oh my God, yes. Okay, yeah, let's do it. Let's do it. And then her, yeah, her husband is electrician in Hollywood he hung up the lights and at first we started out with four tables and I mean now it's not that many tables but um, I was I was really dead set on just doing straight carnita tacos with no interpretation and eventually we just started to throw more twist on it it became a big thing where we started to do more collabs we had the Moosecraft guys come out we had Avi Q we had Bert 
from Slap come out and we had Johnny from PRD. We just had all my friends, basically. Yeah, that's what you do. To come out and like, yeah, it's exactly what I do. And I realized at that point in time that the party poster, party planner and me has really like, I mean, it was during the pandemic was completely asleep. You know, yeah, so this is a way for us to like, you know, express ourselves in the way that we felt we wanted to express ourselves, and for me too. So it was really fun. It was really fun. We just started up again. I think we're on. It'll be the fourth weekend since the reopening. Will be this next week, and um, yeah, it's great. It's it's a good time. We got some heaters out there. Um, some guest chefs coming in. Um, with some so, yeah, a couple of different types of heaters, both in the warmth kind and the chef kind. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> so, you know, to bring it a little full circle, um, it seems like you've done a great job of keeping the tradition alive, but improving or moving the restaurant into the future to continue another another 40 year run as like a fantastic neighborhood spot. Um, Looking back and also looking forward, what advice would you give to anyone who is thinking of making the same jump? You know, if they don't have a Vonda to call and chat with and they're listening to this and they're thinking about getting inside the family business, what advice do you give with them? You know, especially since, you know, we're going through the pandemic now, but your f- restaurant was also around during the financial collapse in 2008, 2009. You know, it's not like the 70s and 80s didn't have their own dark spots of economic turmoil or, or uncertainty. Yeah. Um, what would you advise them on? Whew, I would say reach out to me and Vanda because <laughs> <laughs> we would gladly get a drink with y'all. Um, I think that'd be fun. Uh, well... I think it's uh, the, a family business is an expression of the identity of that family. So, and every person has their mark on that business in some way, shape, or form. So, in order to find longevity in that, you have to maintain the health of all of the family members involved. Mm. And you have to really consider their perspectives. And I would say that my my take has been so abrasive because, like, you know, my parents are very hard-headed and they're very stubborn. And this is their baby. And just know that, yeah. like, if you, take over, if you take over your family's business, you're taking over someone's, like, 40-year-old baby, you know, that they've mm. been nursing this whole time. And I, I didn't realize that because... I didn't realize that until, you know, my parents really said, you know, they really like sat me down and they're like, we have ideas too, you know, like, you know, even mm. though we're not in there now, the pandemic, like, like, like we can think of things, you know, we, we have, you know, we have, we have dishes in mind and dad still has many dishes in mind. And I have to remind myself as you will have to remind yourself, like, you know, consider, consider that anything can be an inspiration. Like you came into this because it was inspiring to you to do this, Mm. right? You have to like really try to capture that feeling in a jar. Remember that there's no greater inspiration than the loved ones around you right now. Like you can look at books and you can listen to podcasts and you can read some articles and stuff. But like there's some gems that you're not seeing and you take it for granted. They're right under your nose. Um, and they're right here with, with your loved ones in front of you. I say that as sort of like regret, regrettably speaking in a way because I know I haven't done that. So <laughs> a good reminder for myself. Yeah, you just uh, play back this tape whenever they're you're going like, what do they want to do? But um, <laughs> it's a good, you know, that's a really beautiful thing. And I think that's the a beautiful sentiment to, to sort of end on. Um, you know, congratulations to the uh, upcoming 40-year anniversary. Uh, can't wait to swing in again and can't wait for this pandemic to be over and we can actually eat in the restaurant um, or in the alleyway at least. 
Uh, if people want to check you out or follow, follow along, you and me both, um, or see what the, cause you change, you announced the weekend, uh, the weekly, uh, Thai taco Tuesday, uh, menu, where can they follow you? How can they get more information? More information on our Instagram is probably the most transparent way to, to find out info. And that's at Anna Jack Pai food, A N A J A K T H A I food. Awesome. Well, Justin, thank you so much. We have another song from the archives and then a live performance here on Snacky Tunes on HRN. This episode is brought to you by HH Bespoke Spirits. The award-winning and critically acclaimed Tailored Spirit Collection features HH Bespoke Gin, Rum, and Vodka. The Black-owned, fashionable portfolio is a lifestyle brand extension to fashion and retail companies, 5001 Flavors, and Harlem Haberdashery. HH Bespoke Spirits is available for sale and to ship nationwide. Learn more at hhbespokespirits.com. Henry, thank you so much for taking the time to sit down and chat with us. Welcome to Snacky Tunes. Thank you. I'm very, very glad to be here. I love snacks. Yeah. We're, uh, (laughs) I mean, it's more private snacks now, but we used to have like a whole pizza, beer set up in in times gone by. Oh, indeed. Like in the studio when you were- In the studio. Yeah. We'd usually have like donuts or- pizza or you know tacos or things like that we it wasn't just a name only how about that you just described my food pyramid yeah it's really it's really good it's (laughs) it's, when i eat that way my body looks like an inverted pyramid and it just like all all slopes down um that's that's the point of life that's the point of life um yeah so you know we always ask for bios when we have people on the show just to get a background and uh, I just have to read the first line of your bio because okay. I've never 
had a more appropriate artist statement for the time, but it says, wouldn't it be great if an artist music could hold your hand through an anxiety attack and then help you laugh it all off once it's over. Now, if that isn't the most appropriate type of music artist I want to hang out with during these (laughs) COVID times, I don't know what is. But how did you land on that? And how has your music been helping people during what is arguably one of like the roughest times of recent history? I wouldn't even see memory. Yeah. I'll go. I'll go straight to history on that one. You're, yeah, we're hitting the we're hitting the history books. Yeah. Uh, yeah, man. I mean, well, I think that naturally, uh, a lot of the um, sort of new, uh, not to use this belabored term or phrase. But uh, the sort of new normal mm. things that that pe- we've we've all entered into uh, are sort of habits that I'm kind of drawn to to begin with. Like regardless of there being sure. a lockdown or quarantine, sure. I'm always uh, fighting against the my incessant urge to be completely solitary <laughs> and like antisocial. Um, or antisocials, maybe they're, it's it more more of like um, introversion, like extreme introversion, kind of. Yeah, and um, so I think I have already had some experience, uh, like existing the way that uh, people most, you know, everyone started to exist in uniform, uh, like during quarantine, right? And uh, so I felt. Uh, motivated to be making music during that time. Like I, there was a, I, I felt, um, almost like, okay, I'm, I'm comfortable in, in this space and like existing this way. And like, I, I think I'm, I might be able to be creative, uh, despite the terrible things that are going on. And maybe I can, you know, make at least one person's day a little better by yeah. going live on Instagram. You know, I was a big part of the proponent of going, going live. I actually, yeah. I, I did a live Instagram show every single night for the first like two and a half months of quarantine. How was that on you as an artist? And was there pressure at some point? Because, you know, there's been that creative balance, right, of where right. people are like, oh, I have this time and I'm home and I have to do output and support fans. But also people go like, I also want to hide in a hole and not yeah. have any yeah. output or not have people, you know, you know, especially as an artist who makes music that people enjoy be their crutch in any way. Like, I just need me time. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Yeah, yeah. I, well, I think I, I sort of treated it as, um, I, well, when I was younger, my dad always, what my dad would say to me was, it's sort of corny, but it's true. And it's, and it's definitely an effective thing. He would be like, if you, when you're, you know, once, when you go to college or, you know, you're living on your own, if you commit to making your bed every single day, you will be able to look back on each day and say, no matter what happens, uh, you can say, you know, even if you get indicted for fraud or whatever, <laughs> something bad, <laughs> whatever, yeah, uh, you can say, at least I made my bed today. At least I did one productive thing. And yeah. I sort of viewed the Instagram lives as that mm-hmm. as well. It was like, okay, I, if I can take 20, 30 minutes out of my day and do this, that is a good day, no matter what. Happen, no matter what else happens i think um and uh I, you, there was just there was like a little small small little community of people that would tune in most nights and we i they nicknamed themselves the hall monitors Ooh. which i enjoyed i yeah, like that I, I agree and the and the and from there we started the cults and uh it is going strong wow uh not actually but that's um, a good uh that's a good <laughs> fan club name by the way yeah it's not bad I, no. I was i was pretty happy with it so uh yeah i mean during this time though creative inspiration can be a little bit hard to come by mm-hmm. what have you been pulling from where have you been 
looking, especially as a, I would say you are maybe more of an intermediate to expert level of solitary creativity, <laughs> as you as you say. Mm-hmm. Um, but even this push might push the boundaries of where you can get inspired. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. No doubt. No doubt. I, well, I, yeah, I mean, all, all of my, or what I've, what I've been saying about like being comfortable, being quarantined yeah. and, and whatever, I, I, that all comes with a disclaimer that it was still a somewhat terrorizing time for me, for me as well. It's not like it was, it was easy or something, but it was right. like, I had some experience with it, I guess. You, you uh, recognize I, that mode a little bit. You're like, I understand. Correct. I understand what this is. That's right. That's right. Yeah. And, um, uh, I, I guess, you know, that's a good question. I don't, creative inspiration for me is really random. Mm. Uh, it can come, uh, when I'm, well, I, I'll say this, it's, it's quite random, but I, but the majority of the time it comes when I'm at one end of the spectrum of like emotional stability or, or the other. Like I'm either really depressed or I'm re- like exuberantly happy, you know, uh, like I'm usually like in those modes of being, I would say when I'm, when I'm f- feeling creative. So, th- so, and the, and there was a lot of like up and down, I think like in this time it, there, there was, you know, you're free from, certain obligations i guess maybe like social obligations or something which was freeing and could be very was sort of exciting for me in that so that's like a that that's that and then also i would at the same time be really down and and like lonely. feel like a dark cloud over me yeah. and feel extremely lonely and yeah exactly and so so yeah i think that 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 um oscillating between those poles of existence that gave me some creative inspiration maybe one more question before we get into the first song but sure since the 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 inspiration emotionally is at the opposite end of the spectrum Mm -hmm. is the result the same do you can you Mm -hmm. write the same type of song depending on which side you're on or if like if i'm on this happy side this is the type of song that i write but if i'm on the more sad depressed side this is the song i write or is it just you get to that state and the creative output can go either way. It's pretty random. Uh, mm. Again, I, the, uh, in, ter- in terms of the actual uh, substance, like of the, of the tunes, uh, I, I would say for me, sad music can be like the biggest boon while you're sad, you know? Yeah. So the, the, uh, cause you feel less alone or what we you know that's that's a whole nother <laughs> topic but i you know i would write thing i i've written things that are both really up and, re- and really down during this time and they've come at you know basically it's basically random you know and maybe, maybe that's the beauty of it and, yeah yeah it just it's like you just need that emotional <laughs> trigger um yeah look, yeah we're gonna talk more about your debut full-length nito later in the the episode but uh the first song we have up is tattoo which is off the yes. album uh yes. what's the quick story behind it and uh you know what do you love about it yeah uh this is the fifth song on the album uh there was a moment where i wanted it to be the first single mm. uh i think when i wrote it but it turned out to be harder to record kind of than i th- thought it would be um not that like I'm not happy with the recording, but it just became more more of a yeah. deep cut. I think like after all was said and done, um, and uh, but uh, regardless of that, it's a s- song about indecision. I'm not nearly decisive enough to get a tattoo. That's the first lyric of the song. So well, there you go. it's it's a song about indecision. <laughs> all right, well here we go. Henry Hall tattooed live here on Snaggy Tunes on HRN. Not nearly decisive enough to get a tattoo That's why I decided to come to you Cause you're not the kind of guy who's really trying to try to mark
band so I have a backing band over which I can play a guitar solo but I don't have them right now so I'm gonna sing the guitar solo it goes like this okay <laughs> Thank you for that track. Super great. Always, uh, always, I would say the one benefit of doing the show a little bit differently now in, in, in quarantine is we're getting different versions of the songs that we do, would normally get. And it's, you know, it's a great thing about live music, right? Or like recordings during a specific era, you get a certain type of song that you may, or version you may have not gotten in an, any other time or any other situation. Um, Without a doubt. the. Yeah that's a bedroom tr track through and through. Yeah. But I mean, that's who doesn't love a good bedroom track. Um, yeah, no, I agree. It's, it's, there's a, there's a certain intimacy to that type of recording and to ideas coming out of a time. Um, you put out a really great EP called quarantine covers for black lives matter, which I thought was really powerful, mm -hmm. really inspiring. Uh, I'd love to hear about, how that project came together, what made you want to put out, um, you know, th that group of songs? Yeah, sure. Um, well, those are all tunes that I loved, love still. And um, I thought that, you know, it would be a good way for me to uh, contribute to a cause that I fully believe in and uh you know a, a, one where i don't want to commandeer the conversation by any means but mm. one where i hope i can uh contribute and uh be offer allyship in the uh best way that i can and i i thought that this is the best thing that i can do is make music and use what i you know my platform for good for black lives matter so i put together those uh tunes in in my bedroom again um yeah on the, on the old laptop and uh yeah it was it was really really fun um and uh all the money went to black lives matter los An the los angeles chapter so i mean that's amazing i mean i think it's you know always good to lend your voice when you can. I know it can always be a tricky conversation or a tricky way to like, how am I doing this? Am I doing this right? But I think yeah, supporting and showing that support, especially something that, um, you know, creating music, creating art and giving it that collection of songs, a title like that is, is very powerful. Um, how did you pick the songs for the album? Um, you know, it's, it's a, it's a great, great selection. What went into your process? For, for for that EP, um, well, I wanted to make a uh, 
sort of uh, cast a wide net, like sure. make a big, you know, big range of tunes. Uh, so each one is very different. Um, and I figured, you know, and, and I'll say this, going back to uh, the Instagram live thing that we talked about in the first segment, uh, they were tunes that I had played, uh, mm. a couple of them have played on the live show and gotten good responses for especially the Grimes cover. Yeah. Um, so that gave me a little bit of a, a window into what people might respond to. Uh, so I was like, screw it. Let's make some fake drums and do these songs for real. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's, it's when going back to what we talked about before, you know, especially when the pandemic was hitting with all the black lives matter, uh, you know, protests and conversation that were going on. Sometimes it was tough for people to connect or to grab onto something. And so it's mm -hmm. nice when you're like, I don't know where to put my feelings or emotions and turn that into a, a project. Um, yeah. What were the reactions from people? Like, were they, were people appreciative, you know, were people like saying like, thank you for just making something for me to latch on to, even if it was momentary. Yeah, I think so. I mean, I, you know, I wasn't um, in it to get f feedback in the way that I am, like from other right. music that I put no, out, of course, ob obviously. Uh, th not, not that you were insinuating that or anything like that, mm -hmm. but uh, the response was great. And, you know, it was right in the crux when people were, when the uh, protests were. Uh, you know, at their height. And, um, uh, I got to, um, you know, also be a part of that. And I could, I, I made some like care packages and stuff and dropped them off. I couldn't actually go to any of the protests cause I see my, my grandma's really old and I see my parents live, uh, near her and we see her like every day of course so i i couldn't really risk that but i got to contribute in that way too so it was all i don't know it, it was it, it was all like a uh it, it, it was a positive mix of of um activities and feedback and um yeah it, it was great it this was a nice little way to sort of mark uh that time uh creatively yeah. Um, you know, when you do a project like this, that like you just said, it's inspired by a certain time or a certain moment, how does mm -hmm. that go on to influence your original work or future work or things like that? Like, what do you pull or what do you remember from um, these very of the time type of projects versus something where like Nito, you're like debut album. This is something that's part of like the bigger canon that you've been thinking about for a while. What inspiration do you pull from yourself? Mm -hmm. Uh, on a smaller project like like the quarantine covers yeah that's a good question uh yeah i mean uh, you know an album the, the the question like what is an what is this album about is right. never a good question because yeah. it's it's not like other uh uh excuse me other uh you know uh cr creative things other uh creative output it's it's like it covers such a wide range of experiences and like oh, you yeah. work on it for so long and you're potentially you know bringing in songs that you wrote years ago to sure. the track list and especially for the first one no doubt yeah it's like you have a sort of backlog i i definitely had like a backlog of songs and i was like yeah. this is a good you know i want i want this on my first album even though it's you know x amount of years old uh, and it, the, to be honest, this was really the first, uh, time I had done some, done, uh, put out a project that was sort of like, so temporally specific, you know, mm -hmm. uh, the, uh, I, all the EPs and everything that I've, that I had put out before that and, and, and Nito included, uh, which came out after uh, the quarantine covers EP, uh, you know, were were like just a sort of best of my life, <laughs> you yeah. know. Uh, so 
it was a, um, I, you know, I don't know. I, I, I would say it's, a, it definitely stands to represent, uh, like memories of a t- period of, of time, like much more accurately, I think for, mm. for me personally, I like uh, that. yeah. And like, I can listen to that and I really go, but you know, I made this songs in a, a week or two, you know, I was working on them and, uh, it, it wasn't a project that spanned like, like I said, over like a year and a half, two years or whatever, like an album is. So whenever I, one of those songs comes up or whatever, I'm like, Oh wow. Yeah. <laughs> this is like, I get brought right back to um, that period of time. making and them. I love that. Cause it's a very poignant sensory type of trigger when mm-hmm. you're like, that is, that was the time in my life and not like, yeah, I wrote the first, the first version of this six <laughs> years ago. And then I noodled with the bridge two years after yeah. that. And you're like, yeah, this thing sort of bleeds over the years. Um, well, yeah. let's hear another track uh, from sure. Mito. Uh, California is the next one you're playing for us. What's the quick story behind that? Story behind. So, well, this is, a, the, the, here's a, this is a great example, actually. Look at that. Look <laughs> at us being, uh, connecting the dots here. Look at us connect uh, the dots. <laughs> uh, this is, I think this is the oldest song on the album, or wow. Monica is the oldest song on the album. This is the second oldest by only like six months. Sure. And um, uh, yeah, it's one that I, I wrote in college and uh, it just always stuck with me and it never quite, uh, you know, I would, write other songs that had similar arrangements uh to it and they would s- sort of leapfrog it to be put at put onto an ep or like just put out or whatever like wyoming is another song of mine that's another state song yeah uh, that sort of like i said leapfrogged california if california was sitting there waiting in the wings kind of to be <laughs> released and wyoming came out instead and uh it just felt appropriate to put this one out um on Nito because it's a, a meaningful song for me and i thought it could sit ni- nice and pretty in that sixth track spot <laughs> amazing all right well here we go yeah. henry hall Nito live track is California on Snacky Tunes on HRN. When I think of California My heart fills with desire Cause I like girls in cars and sun and stuff like that That's why I keep coming back And it's not cause I like it I know that I like it Family's not from Nobody will take my California Just cause I like it that way I'll put you under the ocean, hold you down Just cause I like it that way California California 
California, 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 California. When rock and roll stops here, this is where you fight. This is where you'll find me Oh baby it's not that bad, that bad, that bad The sun will rise again for me Oh baby it's not that bad, that bad, that bad, that bad because you know that I from California, 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 California. California Welcome back. That was just California live from Henry Hall off of Nito. Your debut album, which uh, has, I won't say spanned a lifetime, but definitely spanned a good chunk of your life. And um, I think it's why I always really love debut albums, because you feel you get to really know the person, right? You're like, oh, like, this is the best of what they've done so far, right? Like, this is like the cream of the crop. Mm -hmm. You can really feel, um, and you've even talked about it, just about like, even where you're placing the songs. And like how much thought goes into that album. Um, <laughs> what was it like to put out your first album? Like how did that feel to, to finally go, all right, world, here, here's a full length. It, it was a relief. <laughs> <laughs> You're I like, mom, felt, dad, uh... mom, dad, don't, don't worry. <laughs> I finished the album. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And they're like, oh, thank God. Thank God. Uh yeah, man. I mean, it was, it was, um, uh, it was a long time coming. Mm. Uh, I, uh, every EP I've uh, put out, I've put out four, three or four, five, mm -hmm. something like that. Each one before starting the recording process, I said, okay, am I going to make a full length album? Mm. And then I'm like, nah, no, I'm not, I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to do it. And then I just do the EP. Mm. And then next time I'm like, ah, am I going to, should I, should I make a full length? And I'm like, ah, no, EP. no, no, no. But this time I decided to go full length. And, um, I, I think the, uh, you know, a, a big part of it was I, uh, started working with uh my producer dylan bostick um who's a really incredibly talented producer and um he you know i became mo so much more comfortable in the studio because of working with him um <clears throat> we actually went to high school and college together wow. uh, and always were, were we were always friends but never like close and then I worked with him on questions, comments, concerns, mm. um, which is the um, EP of original music that precedes this album, precedes Nito. And uh, we just really gelled and were fi practically finishing each other's sentences like we'd been married for 35 years uh, by the end of that process. And so I said to myself, like, okay, well, this is someone who I could see myself uh 
working with in a professional capacity, uh, you know, over the course of 13 songs, you know, Mm -hmm. uh, and I I don't feel like I need to kind of test out the water, um, with some other producer or other studio. Uh, like I know that it works with Dylan and I know he he's interested in making more music with me. So I basically said like, I, you know, uh, called him one day and said, do you want to make a full length album? <laughs> and he was totally down. Um, yeah. he's like, thank and, God, um, finally pulled the trigger away from yeah, me. <laughs> exactly. No, it's true. It's true. Yeah. Uh, and you know, and I feel like too, I had, uh, there, like we were talking about before, there were certain songs on the album, like, uh, let's see, Cozy Dying, uh, Sun, Monica, California, uh, 13 Besties, mm-hmm. um, that had been, you know, kind of sitting in my pocket for a long time. Were you and- holding them? Were you like, this is too good to go in the EP. I'm going to bank it for when that album comes. Honestly. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> kind of, you know, I, yeah. the, the, uh, it, it was a combination of, of that and of, um, writing stuff that was new mm. and being uh, kind of swindled by my, <laughs> my own prejudice, <laughs> uh, preferring, uh, like newer stuff. I mean, it's uh, good, but it's not as good as this new thing that I just wrote. Yeah. 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 The yeah. EP's coming out. So let's put the freshie on. Exactly. Yeah. yeah I know love, that. Love this, love this song with this didgeridoo solo. It's like <laughs> super cool. <laughs> not going to get sick of this. Yeah. This is, this is timeless. <laughs> The, this yeah, thing that I love exactly. this week, this isn't going to age out. Yeah, yeah, no, no. So in putting all of the songs that you've been holding out into this EP, it must have been a really good creative release, right? To mm-hmm. say, I'm not holding back. Uh, I'm not punting on the release of this. This one's no longer being tucked in the back pocket. And you're laying it all on the table. Yeah, I, it was uh, a combination of, of release and relief. Uh, you know, mm. I, um, I I think as well, you know, I figured out um, a, uh, a, a sound that I that I felt um, passionate enough about that it could that I would be uh, like fulfilled if it carried through an entire album, which, which was the sound of Nito, which is this sort of like combination of uh, lo-fi uh, bedroom elements and band elements, mm. uh, which is sort of a synthesis of like a lot of the music that I've put out, I think. Uh, and beca- because of, that fact because i had this sound in my head i thought okay you know these tunes that have been in the back pocket uh i'm comfortable like lending them to this style of of arrangement and like instrumentation like i i think it'll serve them well and it's um appropriate for for them to be like included in this collection of of songs um you also got to go on fallon which yeah i did <laughs> you know uh mazel tov because that's incredible thank you um and a really great performance too right uh which sort of Thanks. double-edged sword right because you know obviously you want to be in the studio and you want to do it with the roots and jimmy and being there but you were also able to show a little bit of your visual creativity which comes through in your videos um that you make for the songs um what was it like getting to be on late night and uh, what was it like doing that type of performance? <laughs> uh, it was surreal. Mm. Uh, I still don't really believe that it, that it happened. I uh, saw it on YouTube. It's definitely real. You now I'm like, yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, maybe you're, you know, just part of a network of people trying to make me feel good or something. I don't know. It had, uh, it had views, but, uh, man. It wasn't just me. It had a good, good okay, number of views. Okay. Good, good, good. <laughs> okay. All right. All right. I could breathe easy. Um, yeah, man. I mean, 
it was um honestly all credit is due to uh the crew and our directors hannah baker and ethan young uh who uh helped me put this put the shoot together and led the charge because it's not easy to shoot something during quarantine Mm -hmm. uh during covid times um you have to be incredibly vigilant uh about how you go about things and keeping everybody safe and they were able to do that and uh you know uh create something that really services the song i think you know they uh it was their idea to incorporate that uh day for night look that no, we shot it all we shot it all during the day but but we color corrected it to give it that that sort of uh almost like douglas Serkian like uh <laughs> 50s 60s melodrama looking uh day for night look for half the song and then it's you know splits open into the uh that like warm uh day look so um yeah it was great and and it also you know um just to give you i guess a little preview into uh, where my head is at now creatively like playing with a band and slightly reworking alive annoyed to fit into a band uh uh atmosphere and a band arrangement uh was like a really exciting experience and something I had missed doing. And I found it to be found that like constriction of working with, okay, we've got, we only have two guitars, bass drums and two background singers. Like yeah. let's make this song full and let's make it work. Uh, I found that to be like really inspiring. And we came out with something that I, I, I honestly like it more <laughs> than what's oh, on the album. Like I, there you go. we, we, we sped it up. we, um, you know, strip certain things down and uh, it just sounds so full and big. And D- Dylan Bostick is the other guitar player and, and he produced it and uh, produced the music for it. And I just think it came out so well, thanks to him. And um, uh, that's something that I want to lean into for this, this uh, next batch of tunes that I'm cooking up. Amazing. Well, yeah. you know, the great thing about that is uh, every time you hear that version of that song, it'll take you <laughs> right back to that moment. There you go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's a specific uh, time. There's a time stamp on it. There you Just go. Like the other stuff. Yeah. Just like the other oh, stuff. Yeah. Well, listen, I w- thank you for taking the time to chat with us. Uh, I want to make sure we get in one more track, which I believe is yeah. 13 Besties off uh, Nito. But mm-hmm. if people want to get the album, uh, get some cool Nito masks, which are very – yeah. Apropos or uh, sign up to be <laughs> a, a hall monitor. Where can they go? Where can yes. they find you um, online? Uh, yeah, man. Uh, you can, for all uh, merch stuff, you can just go to my website and click the shop tab, henryhallmusic.com. Uh, you'll see shop there when you're on that oh. home page. Give that a click. And uh, yeah, I'm, every, I'm, I'm everywhere, baby. Awesome. I'm on Spotify. Come Wonderful. On. Well, thank you so much. <laughs> Here is 13 Besties live on Saki Tunes on HRN. We will see you next time. I got what you need, Nelly. You can count on me. Kathy, anything for real. Freddie, put your trust in me. Raymond, anything you want. I'll get for you to fly Xander, just a twist of life And just time after time Jonathan, I don't see why I can't show my love to you guys Thirteen besties No need to cry
the codes that I only use with you, just like best friends do. And despite what Amber said, oh, Bill, there are twelve other friends. Bill, there. This program is powered by Simplecast. Thanks for listening to Heritage Radio Network, food radio supported by you. For our freshest content and to hear about exclusive events, subscribe to our newsletter. Enter your email at the bottom of our website, heritageradionetwork.org. Connect with us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at heritage underscore radio. Heritage Radio Network is a nonprofit organization driving conversations to make the world a better, fairer, more delicious place. And we couldn't do it without support from listeners like you. Want to be a part of the food world's most innovative community? Rate the shows you like, tell your friends, and please join our community by becoming a member. Just click on the beating heart at the top right of our homepage. Thanks for listening.